really, I think it's the ability to to deliver a, uh, a services or IT infrastructures over the web in in a way that's that in a massively uh, scalable way. Uh, and, and and I think in in uh, Katz's recent book, he talks about uh, entering a term that we, we we've heard in the web in the early days, which is disintermediation. It, it's taking the intermediary out. In this case, a lot of the IT service providers, things that I do for a living in an infrastructure area, kind of take that out of the way so that the consumer of the service. Um, is interacting directly with the service itself. And, and it, it could be a, an infrastructure service like storage or compute cycles, or it could be a very high-level business service. Uh, IDC calls it cloud services instead of cloud computing. Uh, and, and things like uh, Salesforce.com, uh, for instance, or Force.com, where you're actually acquiring the services over out of the cloud or, or from the, the provider, not just the IT infrastructure. I think that the two biggest values are the ability to increase your functionality and support uh, and uh, at a cost level that uh, higher ed can afford. And when I'm talking about that, the, just the ability to deliver increased functionality, 24 by 7 support, high availability, disaster recovery kinds of things that uh, are, are extremely difficult to do in particularly small institutions uh, and do that at a, at a value. Uh, that uh, we can afford. For instance, we think higher ed institutions can collaborate to create a cloud for our, our, our constituents. And so, for instance, the Hathi Trust, uh, which is the uh, recently announced program with IU and the CIC, where we're taking the results of Google Books in inventory and making that available to all the CIC institutions in a collaborative way, mm -hmm. uh, rather than have each institution running their own such service. And so I actually see both of those modes continuing in higher ed, both the commercial side, but also the ways that we can do things collaboratively mm -hmm. uh, to create our own re regional clouds, uh, specialized clouds. We certainly have uh, began to look at uh, student email, for instance, as software as a service. Rather than provide that institutionally at IU, we look at the vendors of Google and Microsoft, in our cases, uh, to provide that service to the students in, in, in a way that, that comes out of the cloud or really from their, their central facility. I will talk a, a bit about IU student email and what kind of issues that we think we, we can talk about. As, as student email is, I think, a bit of a, a, a special function in the cloud, maybe the first, first foray into that kind of process that uh, higher ed institutions moved into. Very technically, how you provision accounts, how you deal with single sign-on, all those real technical areas, and then also making sure you have a good relationship with a lawyer because it's a big, a big part of what we're talking about here. Right. So we're, we're navigating some waters that we haven't been at before with, with these functions. Um, I, I'm not as concerned as much about uh, data privacy. Uh, that was a, a lot of early concern, but I think the, the privacy statements by both of these vendors as they deliver to students is sound. But I probably have spent a lot more time meeting with lawyers uh, in the last year than I ever have in any previous years of, of employment. And understanding how that impacts uh, your state guidelines for protection of data, your state guidelines for liabilities, uh, the federal uh, compliance issues, whether that's uh, uh, FERPA is the one that we talk about a, a lot, and, and there's some changing requirements around FERPA that the Department of Ed has, has, is coming out with. So uh, making sure that you really have all of the details of your interaction between your institution and the vendor. Uh, how you're getting email back and forth, who does the email relays, how we deal with spam listing. Uh, it, it, it can be very difficult because um, it, it, there are trade-offs there and, and the way they want you to whitelist their functions, you either almost have to whitelist all of Google, and that's not a good idea because we get a lot of spam from Google, uh, or uh, we uh, uh, have to, to, to whitelist none of them and let it all go through our spam filter. But when you do that, then you've got a, f a student who may send a note to a faculty member and that, that email may end up in a junk mail folder. And, and those are, are issues that we've got to work through from a compromising of how we deal with that. And I don't think the vendors are quite there yet. And we chose not a single provider. We actually give students the choice between Google and Microsoft. And we invited a few others to, to uh, respond to our RFP, and they were the only two that responded. And, and uh, uh, it, it, we let them compete 
for students, and we think that's that's very beneficial. Well, we've already uh, uh, provisioned thirty-seven thousand accounts between these two vendors, so so clearly it's successful. Students like the functionality uh, and, and like what we're dealing with. Yeah, the concern of the cloud computing uh, has you lose control uh, of your resources has a certain amount of validity to it and and uh, I, I'm, I, I know uh, you just read me the quote from uh, Richard Stallman that mm -hmm. talked about his concerns. That was one of them that I had not read prior to that, but I know he t talked about this being a really a, a, a bit of an, an Id idiocracy and idiocy. In a bit, that's a, a little naive. Um, certainly, it, it, it's almost like saying, it, you know, if we don't grow all our own food or we don't make our own clothes, uh, you know, we've lost control over that. But I, I, I do I do appreciate that there is a certain loss of control that goes beyond that, and and uh, and you have to worry as we. It, enter into commercial endeavors is when we put things in the cloud, not necessarily when we get things from it, but when we put things in the cloud, can we get that back? If we put our data in uh, a storage that's provided uh, uh, by some commercial vendor, can we bring that, that data back? And how do we bring that back? Uh, and in a format that we can then reuse because we may want to change uh, over time either the providers that we choose or whether or not we want to do something internally or, or externally. Right. There's a CIO in a healthcare institution in, in uh, Indiana that says all control is, uh, uh, is fictional anyway. Uh, you know, I don't know if I buy into that, but I think there is some truth to the fact that, that we, you just have to balance all of those issues out. There's a couple of, of, of multiple things to, to, to talk about here. Where is the value, where's the innovation to create in the Wikonomic world where massive, uh, where everything is, is taking place in, in kind of a massive uh, uh, collaboration mode? And then what's the benefit of open software? in this mode if you're really just acquiring your software or your services from the cloud. Uh, when open software came out, you know, Bill Gates once said that uh, open software is a threat to innovation because innovation is driven by capitalism, by commercial function. And, and, and that strikes me as being a, a little bit of a common argument here in, in the cloud. I think innovation will occur in lots of ways because we innovate for, for several reasons. One is because uh, there's a commercial reason to innovate. The other is that there is a societal reason to innovate. We innovate to, to help society in, in general. And I think, I think whether we're doing things in the cloud or whether we're doing things uh, uh, locally and whether we're collaborating for that in, in, innovation, that will occur because that's what we, that's what we do. Mm -hmm.